When asked why the geography of the Kingdom of Hyrule found in the Zelda series changes so radically from game to game, why locations with the same names keep popping up yet with completely different aesthetics and even geographical locations, Nintendo's blatant answer is that it simply makes each individual game more interesting to explore. In a franchise with this many installments, having the exact same overworld map with the exact same looking Lake Hylia, Death Mountain and Gerudo Desert would no doubt become tiresome and repetitive. The similar names are simply there to give seasoned players some sense of familiarity, when the reason behind a major inconsistency is that it makes the games more interesting, aka it purely exists for game design reasons, this answer can be a tough pill to swallow for a Zelda theorist, as it is their job or passion to try and make sense of this universe, and piece together its overarching history, find consistencies or explanations for the lack thereof, and uncover the mysteries and secrets hiding in this world. Nintendo clearly wants us to do the thinking. A significant portion of the series accepted lore such as the infamous timeline is inspired and even shaped by its fans, and it becomes obvious that the people behind these amazing games themselves have a hard time keeping up with their own established lore, resulting in changes in the narrative, retcons, inconsistencies and paradoxes all throughout the series. Zelda lore will never be perfect, but that won't stop fans from continuing to work on this puzzle, even if the explanations presented aren't always definitive or watertight, and today we are doing exactly that. Even though we already know the answer as to why Hyrule keeps changing, we will attempt to come up with ideas that circumvent the aspect of game design and turn it into something that can be explained without breaking the fourth wall. We will mostly focus on Hyrule, though in some cases other kingdoms or locations outside the borders of the kingdom will be referenced but not explored on a deeper level, as most of these don't have a history spanning across multiple games and thus we have no idea about their past or future. With all that said, let's dive into the history and geography of the Kingdom of Hyrule. When talking about Hyrule, we have to start at the very beginning. Before time began, before spirits and life existed, three goddesses of power, wisdom and courage descended from the heavens to create order out of chaos, giving birth to a world with a physical form, laws, and finally spirits and life forms to uphold said laws. There seems to be a misconception that the goddesses only created Hyrule, and due to the wording and some of the backstories told, this misconception is understandable. However, Hyrule is just one of many locations that exist within this world. The goddesses didn't just create Hyrule, but in fact, well, everything. This includes any location that exists on the same physical plane as Hyrule, places like Holodrum, Labrina, and Hytopia, but also those that exist in other realms or dimensions such as the Sacred Realm, Twilight Realm, Termina, and more. Though each of these worlds and dimensions usually have their own cultures and guardian deities, it all ultimately ties back to the original three goddesses of creation. Upon departing back to the heavens, the creators leave behind a symbol of their power, a relic consisting of three sacred triangles, each one representing one of the three goddesses' virtues. Additionally, the creators gave life to a divine being by the name of Hylia, also known as her grace or goddess Hylia. Though not as omnipotent and powerful as the creators themselves, in their absence she would serve the role of the highest being in this world, and thus the Triforce was left in her care. Rumors of the existence of the Triforce quickly spread amongst the population, and it was said that those who managed to obtain the Holy Relic are bestowed upon the power to make any wish come true. Due to its tempting nature, it quickly became the most sought after object in existence, and it didn't take long for the inhabitants of the world to start fighting amongst each other over its possession. Wars ensued and the Triforce would be hidden, sealed, split into pieces and reobtained multiple times throughout history. Enter the very first story in the chronology of the Zelda series, Skyward Sword, a game which actually takes place in two different eras due to the advent of time travel. To get a better picture, let's start by outlining some of the most important events that took place during these two eras. The rise of the Demon Tribe under the command of Demise, also known as the Demon King, who seeks to eradicate every living being in the world and secure his total domination through the use of the Triforce, making this the very first conquest for the Holy Relic. Goddess Hylia sends the surviving human population along with the Triforce up into the skies on a piece of landmass later known as Skyloft, to keep them out of harm's way and prevent the relic from falling into the hands of the Demon Tribe. 
Hylia herself remains on the surface to wage war against the Demon King, resulting in his temporary defeat through the use of a seal placed on him. Knowing this seal won't last long, Hylia strives to use the Triforce to eradicate Demise once and for all. But because the Triforce cannot be used by the hands of divine beings, she assumes a mortal form by fusing her soul with a vessel or spirit maiden, this maiden being the very first incarnation of Zelda, whose future descendants will continue to pass on the essence of the goddess through their bloodline. Additionally, we see the rise of the very first knight or hero chosen by the goddess, that being the very first incarnation of Link. We see the birth of the Master Sword, a sword forged with the sole purpose of striking down and sealing away Demise were he to succeed in breaking free from his seal. We witness the first iteration of time travel through the use of portals known as the Gates of Time. This is also the first time the Triforce is used, that being Link who wishes for the destruction of Demise. And finally, the defeat and sealing away of Demise inside the Master Sword, but not before uttering a devastating curse, one that causes a never-ending cycle, an incarnation of his hatred which shall ever follow the goddess and chosen hero and their descendants until the end of time. This hatred will later manifest in the form of Ganondorf and possibly other beings such as Vati and Maladus as well, though that last part is still unconfirmed at this point. Now, here's where we need to make a clear distinction. During this era, the land where this battle between Hylia and Demise takes place is already known as Hyrule. Though, mind you, this is not yet the kingdom of Hyrule as we come to know it later. The royal family of Hyrule has not been established at this point, and it's likely that during this era people were still living in tribes segregated from one another. Despite this, we do see the first familiar names pop up in Hyrule's geography. Names like Elden, Faron, and Laneru, named after the three dragon spirits who watch over each of their respective province and whose names are obviously derived from the original three golden goddesses, Din, Faror, and Neru. We will eventually see the names of these provinces and even the dragon spirits themselves make a return in later games. Aside from the provinces, names like Lake Hylia, Death Mountain, and Gerudo Desert are still absent at this point in time. Some notable locations we do find are the Seal Temple, also known as the Temple of Hylia, and the Temple of Time. Now here is where it gets a bit confusing. The Temple of Time we find here, which is located in the Laneru Desert, is not at all linked to the same one we find in later games. It's an unrelated structure which bears the same name, probably because this is where the first Gate of Time was located before Hylia destroys it during one of her escapes to the past. The Gate of Time is what allows Link and his friends to travel between their own time period and around a thousand years ago. When Demise was only recently sealed by Hylia, Link later learns of the existence of a second Gate of Time which will be assembled inside the Seal Temple. This temple is also where the Master Sword is laid to rest at the very end of the game. Another important thing to outline are the most prominent races which exist in this time period, that being the people of Skyloft, also known as Skyloftians, who after Demise's defeat will repopulate the surface and will later become known as the Hylians, the Loftwing, giant rideable bird creatures who remain above the clouds at the end of the story, the Sheikah, an ancient tribe who are described as the guardians and servants of goddess Hylia, Gorons, beings made of pure rock, the forest-dwelling Kikwi, mole-like creatures known as Magma, and the Perella, aquatic creatures who resemble a mix between a seahorse and a jellyfish. From here we work our way towards the second entry in the chronology, the Minish Cap. It's unknown how much time has passed between Skyward Sword and Minish Cap, though it is implied that many, many ages have passed since. At the end of Skyward Sword's story, the Triforce remained under the protection of Zelda, aka the mortal incarnation of Hylia, and on the road leading up to Minish Cap some very significant events took place. First off, a group of dark sorcerers known as the Interlopers try to take possession of the Triforce. A war breaks out between the Interlopers and the followers of Hylia, and to prevent the relic from falling into the hands of this power-hungry tribe, they are eventually sealed inside a dimension known as the Twilight Realm, where they and their descendants will eventually lose their ambitions for world dominance and instead live their lives as a peaceful civilization, later known as the Twilight. As a result of this second attempt at claiming the Triforce by mortals, the relic is placed inside the Sacred Realm, which is a dimension closely tied to Hyrule. To top it off, the Light Sage Raru constructs a temple on top of the remains of the Seal Temple from Skyward Sword, which was heavily damaged during the war with the Interlopers. This temple continues to serve as the location where the Master Sword sleeps, but now also serves as a gateway into the Sacred Realm. To prevent anyone from entering the Sacred Realm and once again taking possession of the Triforce, Raru himself 
enters the sacred realm to watch over it, and subsequently seals the entrance to the Holy Land behind him. This newly built structure is the Temple of Time, which as mentioned before is not the same Temple of Time from Skyward Sword, but rather a completely new one built on top of the ruins of the Seal Temple where Link laid the Massasaur to rest at the end of the game. The next event is a theory which some fans have dubbed the Great Migration. The idea is that sometime before, during or after the Interloper War, the various races of Hyrule started to migrate into all kinds of different directions. For example, the Gorons who favor mountainous and even volcanic environments, and yet were not present at Elden Volcano and Skyward Sword, likely migrated to the Elden Province. Though it is also clear that smaller groups of them also traveled to different mountain ranges, as they are also found on Mount Kreno and Minish Cap, and even outside the borders of Hyrule in Labrina and Holodrum. The same thing goes for the Skyloftians who also likely broke up into different subgroups which each took off in different directions. A significant portion of them will go on to become the Hylians. Others may have decided to stay on Skyloft or went somewhere else in Hyrule. For instance, there's a theory that Groos, one of the Skyloftians who played a fairly big role in Skyward Sword, may be the original ancestor of the Gerudo due to his red hair and yellow eyes, a common trait of the Gerudo and isn't found on any of the other Skyloftians. And either he himself or some of his descendants decided to live in the Laneru desert area. Lastly, and perhaps the most significant for this theory, the first line of the royal family who are descendants of the mortal incarnation of Hylia established the Kingdom of Hyrule, the first iteration of it. And it shows because the Hyrule we see in Minish Cap is way smaller than the ones found in most of the other Zelda games, indicating that this is when the kingdom was still in its infancy and had not yet expanded its borders. Since Skyward Sword's rendition of Hyrule is the very first depiction of the land in the chronology of the series, it only makes sense that we mostly use this map as a basis or reference for most of the upcoming titles. If we look back at the overworld from Skyward Sword, we can see that huge chunks of it are unexplored. All three provinces are separated by unknown territory, and it's likely that the Kingdom of Hyrule we see in Minish Cap is located somewhere in one of these unmapped areas. The biggest indication of this is that none of the recognizable landmarks from Skyward Sword are present within the borders of this newly found kingdom. No volcano, no desert, and no Farren Woods. Now it could be that the Minish Woods to the southeast are a small section of the Farren Woods, but this doesn't have to be the case. After all, it's unlikely that the Farren Woods are the only woods out there, so I'm more inclined to believe that this is a different forest altogether. And Mount Crenel, though it does have some small volcanic activity on the inside of the mountain, is clearly not classified as a volcano, and thus in all probability unrelated to Elden Volcano. Looking at Minish Cap's Hyrule, we do see the first familiar faces show up in its geography. Places like Lake Hylia, named after the goddess, Hyrule Field, and of course the first rendition of Hyrule Castle and Castle Town. We even see the first iteration of Lon Lon Ranch, the center point of Hyrule's agriculture. In terms of races, we find the Hylians, who are the descendants of the Skyloftians from Skyward Sword, the Minish, also known as the Picori among Hylians, tiny thumb-sized creatures who travel to Hyrule from a different dimension, also known as the Minish Realm, the Deku who make their first appearance here, Gorons who are said to have lived on Mount Krenel for a while until their numbers started to dwindle in this area, and the Wind Tribe, a humanoid race who at some point mastered the power of the winds and elevated their capital to the skies. Now obviously I could literally devote an entire video to each individual race alone, where they came from, which race they may have evolved from, or what caused their disappearance. For instance, the Kikwi, Magma and Perella are no longer around and are never seen again after the events of Skyward Sword. So for instance, could the Kikwi have evolved into the Deku given their flower-based characteristics? Or were the Deku always living in this unexplored area, and the Kikwi simply migrated elsewhere? Or stayed behind in the Farren Woods and evolved into something else or simply went extinct at some point? Did the Zora really evolve from the Perella as many fans speculate or are they completely unrelated? I mean, who's to say that the Zora didn't originate from outside the borders of Hyrule? After all, we find them in other lands as well. Maybe they originated from Termina or Labrina or some other unknown land somewhere. There are also various theories about the Wind Tribe. Some link them to the Oku from Twilight Princess, others suggest that they are a subgroup of the original Skyloftians who decided to return to the skies. Some even link them to the Gerudo due to the fact that they have red hair. And then we have the Sheikah, which, well, they just kind of pop in and out of existence from time to time. Though they are usually bound to the Hylian royal family in some way. Anyway, it's hard to keep track of what happened to each race exactly after the Great Migration. And their fates are filled with all kinds of what-if scenarios, which all deserve their own separate videos. Many of which have already been made by other theorists, so instead we need to keep our focus on the land of Hyrule itself. 
The last question that remains about Minish Cap's Hyrule is why didn't the Hylians build their capital closer to the Temple of Time? Which, if you remember, is located on top of the ruins of the Seal Temple right here. Well, I think a better question would be why should they? After the Interloper War, the area surrounding the Seal Temple was likely devastated. On top of that, Raru had taken care of the Triforce, placed it in the Sacred Realm and closed the entrance behind him. With no more Triforce to protect and the land ravaged by war, it would make sense that the ancestors of the Hylians would choose to migrate to richer lands and establish their kingdom in lands untouched by conflict and just leave the past behind. Hence why the Temple of Time is nowhere to be found in Minish Cap. Okay, so my voice just completely broke down after this point. So, the next day. Which brings us to Four Swords, the game which inspired the making of the Minish Cap, yet chronologically takes place centuries after it. Despite its disconnected nature from the rest of the series, the version of Hyrule we see here is actually pretty easy to pinpoint. The game features no towns, no Hyrule Castle, and only one recognizable landmark from later games, that being Death Mountain. Chronologically, this is the first time we see the volcano under this new name, and most agree that this is the very same as the one from Skyward Sword, which previously carried the name Elden Volcano. This is largely due to the fact that we never see any other volcanoes in Hyrule, uh, not of this size anyway. Anyway, as well as the fact that in some of the later games the province Death Mountain resides in is called Elden. It's likely that the Gorons who migrated to this mountain sometime after Skyward Sword are the ones responsible for renaming it from Elden Volcano to Death Mountain, since it has since become their territory after all. Due to the presence of Death Mountain here and its absence in Minish Cap, we can determine that this game takes place outside the original borders of the Kingdom of Hyrule. So either the Kingdom has expanded its borders to the north towards Death Mountain since then, or these incarnations of Link and Zelda are venturing beyond the borders during their quest, which would explain why there's no towns or settlements. We also see no trace of Farren Woods or the Leneru Desert. So this is definitely a mere fraction of the world we saw in Skyward Sword. All other locations like the Sea of Trees and Talus Cave are areas never before seen in any other game and never make a return later down the line, and thus carry no real weight on Hyrule's history. In the Anniversary Edition of Four Swords, there's an additional area called the Realm of Memories. But this is confirmed to be nothing but an illusory realm where the memories of events from future and past games are stored. Basically a cheap excuse to play stages from other Zelda titles and nothing more. Next up is the big one. The game which by far has the greatest impact on the future of Hyrule and its inhabitants. Ocarina of Time. It is told by one of the game's backstories that sometime between the events of Four Swords and Ocarina, another great war broke out. However, this war is not about the Triforce, but rather about territory. Over the span of the many ages since Skyward Sword, you had all these different civilizations living segregated from each other. The Zoras emerged and established their own domain in the east, the Gorons to the north who built large cities and dominated the Elden region, and suddenly you had these desert dwellers to the west who were also growing in numbers, building settlements and even establishing their own religion and culture. And as you remember, the original kingdom of Hyrule, that being the one from Minish Cap, was relatively small and its borders didn't cross into other territories. So for countless years you had these large civilizations thriving independent from each other, four big regional powers coexisting side by side. And what does any kingdom or regional power want? Exactly, expand. More people means bigger demand for housing, more resources and thus more land. Suddenly these big civilizations are on each other's doorstep. Borders start overlapping, so obviously the inevitable happens. Tensions boil over and conflict breaks out, thus starting the Hyrulean Civil War. If we are to believe the stories, this war was one of the most brutal conflicts in Hyrule's history, perhaps only rivaled by Demise's genocide during the rise of the Demon Tribe before the events of Skyward Sword. This conflict gave birth to places like the Shadow Temple where prisoners of war were tortured by the Sheikah, a tribe of warriors and assassins who operated from the shadow on behalf of the royal family of Hyrule. We only ever saw one of them throughout history so far, that being Impa from Skyward Sword. And though they remained absent until now, it's clear that they always remained in close contact with the royal family. And here they are, back again, willing to serve the royal bloodline of Goddess Hylia, and in the most brutal way possible. This war lasted all the way up right before the events of Ocarina of Time. Among the casualties of this conflict were Link's parents, which is when his mortally wounded mother leaves the boy in the care of the great Deku Tree of the forest before passing away. So when we start Link's adventure in the game, the war has only been resolved for a couple of years. 
At some point while Link was growing up in the Kokiri forest, the kingdom of Hyrule eventually emerged victorious. Faced with defeat at the hands of the dominant kingdom, the leaders of the three remaining regional powers, the Gorons, Zora and Gerudo, swore loyalty to the king and their territories were absorbed into the now unified kingdom of Hyrule. Among these leaders was Ganondorf, the king of the Gerudo, also known as the king of thieves. Peace returned to the land, however, this was short-lived. Bittered and humiliated by his defeat at the hands of the royal family, Ganondorf devised a scheme to take possession of the Triforce, which still remained sealed inside the Sacred Realm behind the Door of Time inside the Temple of Time. And despite his inevitable defeat and sealing away at the end of the game, Ganondorf is actually successful at obtaining the Triforce. However, as per the rules of the Triforce, if someone with an evil heart attempts to obtain it, the relic splits into three different pieces and only the part that reflects their personality and desires remains with that individual. The two remaining parts are then bestowed upon two other individuals who reflect each piece's virtue. The Triforce of Power remains with Ganondorf, Wisdom landing on Zelda and Courage on Link. Despite not possessing the full Triforce, the power of this individual piece does allow Ganondorf to become the King of Evil, and with his newfound power invades Hyrule and takes control of the Seat of Power, killing the King in the process. It also grants him the ability to transform into his giant boar-like alter ego, Ganon. So now it's time to take a look at the actual map of Ocarina of Time. First off, we see the first iteration of Kakariko Village a village originally founded and inhabited by the Sheikah, but because most of them were killed during the war, it's now inhabited by Hylians instead. But the most important thing worth noting is of course the return of the Temple of Time, which, if we remember from the Minish Cap era, was not present in that game, likely because of the migration of the Hylians after the Interloper War. Meaning that at some point between Minish Cap and Ocarina of Time, the Hylians returned back to the land of their distant ancestors. It's possible that as Hyrule started expanding its borders in the run-up to the Hyrulean Civil War, they stumbled upon the old lands to the south of the original capital, and decided to move their capital back to the land of their origin close to the Temple of Time. Because of the presence of this holy temple, we can easily pinpoint where Ocarina of Time's capital is located on Skyward Sword's map, which is here since this is where the Temple of Time was constructed by Rauru. If we compare the two maps, we can see that there are some strong resemblances in the geography. The forest to the southeast, Death Mountain to the north, and the desert to the west, all relatively consistent with their locations from the Era of the Sky. But there are some inconsistencies as well. For instance, Lake Hylia, which was last seen in the Minish Cap, used to be to the east of the capital, yet here it's located to the southwest. Similarly, Lon Lon Ranch, also last seen in the Minish Cap, was also located to the east right beside Lake Hylia, and is now found in the middle of Hyrule Field. Farron Woods doesn't seem to exist and instead we find the Lost Woods with the Kokiri Forest tucked away inside it. And although Death Mountain does lie above the capital, its position isn't perfect. In Skyward Sword, the volcano lies straight to the north of the Seal Temple, whereas in Ocarina of Time it lies considerably closer to the castle and has shifted to the northeast. In order to explain these inconsistencies, we need to talk about two different aspects, plate tectonics and geographical renaming. Plate tectonics kinda speaks for itself, which is the idea that the provinces of Hyrule slowly change locations over time. This is something that happens in real life as well. Our planet's crust is made up of fragments, also known as tectonic plates. These plates are in constant motion, some moving as fast as 15 centimeters or close to 6 inches a year. This doesn't seem like much, but given enough time, this can drastically change a landscape. For instance, 200 million years ago, the Earth looked like this. 200 million years seems like a lot, but if we compare this to the actual age of the planet, which is 4.5 billion years, 200 million is nothing. Knowing all of this, it really isn't all that crazy to think that Hyrule undergoes the same type of changes over time. The events of Skyward Sword and Minish Cap alone already take place many, many ages apart from each other. So you can imagine just how much time has passed by the time Ocarina of Time comes along. A strong indication that plate tectonics do indeed occur in Hyrule is the presence of Death Mountain. The borders where tectonic plates meet, also known as fault lines, commonly have a lot of volcanic activity. In fact, the large majority of Earth's volcanoes are located close to these faults because, well, that's where all the action is. As plates crash into each other, they create cracks and creases in the surface, allowing for molten rock to pass through the crust, thus creating volcanoes. 
This phenomena could explain why certain locations slightly shift directions throughout the timeline, and why in this case Death Mountain is no longer located in the exact same location as it was in Skyward Sword. Over the many years, it slowly moved southeast, closer to the sealed grounds. Of course, plate tectonics can't explain all changes in Hyrule's geography. If the change of a location is too drastic relative to the others, for instance if the Lost Woods would all of a sudden be located completely on the other side of the map, yet other locations remain the same, this explanation won't do. Next we have geographical renaming, and we will use Lake Hylia as an example. It's easy to assume that the Lake Hylia found in Ocarina of Time and the one from Minish Cap are not at all the same location. It simply doesn't match. So then, why do they have the same name? Well, whenever the Hylians settle somewhere new, or in this case return to the land they left behind ages ago, obviously they're gonna start naming things. And as most civilizations do, these names are usually derived from their own culture and beliefs, things they know from their own mythology. Similar to how in real life we name the planets of the solar system after Greek gods, or how in cities we name streets and boulevards after famous authors, historical figures, or other people or events, things that had an impact and defy our culture in some way. So whenever the Hylians settle somewhere and they find a big lake in the area, obviously they're gonna call it Lake Hylia. Hylia of course being the most dominant figure in their religion and mythology. The lake usually serves as an important source of the kingdom's drinking water, and thus they are largely dependent on it when it comes to their survival. So it's only fitting that they name it after one of their most sacred deities. In a sense, it's like a tradition. By that definition, this also explains Lon Lon Ranch. Obviously, it's not the same ranch as the one from Minish Cap. It's just a name, a place that represents the heart of their agriculture. The large fields and barrens surrounding the capital will always be named Hyrule Field. You get the point. So what about names like Eldin, Faron, and Leneru? Whatever happened to those? Well, who's to say that this isn't what they're called in this era? The map in Ocarina of Time doesn't use province names, only names of specific landmarks. It's entirely possible that the Death Mountain area is in fact called Eldin, and that the Lost Woods are part of the Faron province. It's just that nobody in the game uses the names of these provinces. We can even see this later down the line in Twilight Princess, where the Lost Woods and Faron Woods are closely connected. As for the Gerudo Desert no longer being called the Leneru Desert, that too is easily explained. Leneru is a name derived from Hylian mythology. However, the Hylians haven't been present in the desert area ever since the Great Migration. Instead, this new civilization, the Gerudo, have been living in these wastes for ages. A civilization which developed its own culture, so obviously they're gonna want to name their homeland after something related to them. Hence it became known as the Gerudo Desert and lost the Leneru name. And while we're on the topic of naming things, we also have to remember that the Hylians returned to these parts of Hyrule after ages of living somewhere else. So it's entirely possible that a lot of the old place names like Farron Woods have simply been forgotten since then. Instead they find a big forest which is easy to get lost in and they simply call it the Lost Woods. And lastly we also need to keep in mind that places like the forest, desert and mountains are likely but a fraction of the whole province. Just because the map's borders end doesn't mean that there isn't a whole lot more forest, desert and mountains and fields beyond the visible borders. Which explains why places like the Gerudo Desert are so small compared to the vast Leneru desert from Skyward Sword. There's probably a whole lot more desert beyond the Desert Colossus. And that concludes part one of our journey through Hyrule's long history and its geography. You heard that right, this is the start of a new mini-series which will consist of four more episodes, because honestly this subject is way too extensive for one single video. This episode covered the unified timeline, and in the next we will be covering the first of the three timeline branches taking place after the timeline split at the end of Ocarina of Time, that being the downfall timeline. But before rounding up, I have a very, very special mention. As this is not just a regular video, oh no. This is actually a special Christmas episode devoted to two, or should I say three, fans of the channel. A very Merry Christmas to Elijah and Dominic Celso. Your father Jonathan requested this special episode just for you guys. And the idea and subject for this episode was entirely his idea. I hope you have some great holidays together and thank you so much for giving me the honor to make a video like this. So again, thank you to Elijah, Dominic, and their father, Jonathan. Man, I wish I had a dad who was a Zelda fan. You guys are very lucky. And you can truly see that these guys are real adventurers. You got your campfire, you got your tent. That is just awesome. 
Anyway, that is all for now. A Merry Christmas to everyone else, a special thanks to my Patreons, and I hope you will join me in the next episode for some more detective work and puzzling together the rich history of Hyrule. This is Dawn signing off, and have a good one.